Uh, when I started to come to this church in 1990, we had maybe three moms <laughs> in our church, and many of them are college students and stuff. And now we have many moms that we can celebrate together, and it's so wonderful. Well, this is this me? Past week, I was at, uh, from Monday to Thursday, I was in Ontario. Uh, we were involved in a conference. It's called uh, KBEMF. It stands for Korean Baptist English Ministers Fellowship. It was started more than like 20-some years ago where we want to encourage um, the English ministry leaders in North America and um, and this year we had uh, one cool thing about it was that we had some Hmong brothers to come and join us. Uh, how many of you guys know the people group called Hmong? Oh, good, a lot of people. Praise the Lord, you know. And so there were about maybe uh, he told me the number about two hundred thousand or three hundred thousand Hmong in North America. Most of them are in uh, uh, California Valley. Oh, is it the battery? I put a new battery. Valley. Is something wrong, huh? Yeah, most of them are in the from Sacramento or um, like Redding in the Central Valley of California and Minnesota. They're so far away, right? And so there was a national directors come and. You know, they, there are maybe like 30 um, English ministers in Hmong group, and they wanted to come and, you know, and, and study us or learn from us. And so it was a very great time for us to encourage them, right, in their journey of creating, because they're having their first generation Hmongs, you know, but now there's a second generation, English speaking, right, you know, and so how they get supposed to get together, and things like that, and so... Images to the whole, and huh? Yeah, sorry. Yeah, I I I talk pretty loud too. You don't need you know, I don't I don't really don't need a microphone. You know. <laughs> yeah. And so it was a great time for them to learn from us and encourage them, and um, and so they want to come back uh, next year. And you know, so how God blesses a person, right, in a group or right, and then that blessing is not just for themselves only. And how the blessing must flow through them, right, to reach the ends of the earth, right? Right. It's not just you're not the end destination of God's blessing. And when we, you know, sing about God's blessing and so that we can be the blessing of God and, you know, receive God's blessing and may that blessing, you know, flow in us and through us and reach many other people groups in this world. So it's it's great to be in that right, in the channel of God's blessing, right, and where many others can be blessed as well. So let's, let's take offering. And as you know, Journey Christian Fellowship is a member-supported church, which means that all the ministries and the staffs are supported by our joyful and generous giving. If you are new with us, please don't feel any obligation to give. And uh, we're so glad that you're with us worshiping God together. And if you are a member of Journey Christian Fellowship, and if you are a regular attender, would you please consider giving generously in light of how God has been generous and gracious to us. So give generously, systematically, proportionally, joyfully as an expression of God's lordship of our life and our finances and so that we can you know, exercise good stewardship and further God's kingdom as we can do more ministries together. You can easily give through our church center app or, or our website or text to give, or you can also drop a check in the box uh, in the back of our room. So let's, let me pray for us. Father God, we thank you so much in all the ways that you have blessed us. 
Father, we desire to be blessing to the world in the ways that we serve this community, college students, and um, and allowing people to get to know you and grow in you. We thank you so much for that you have called us to be salt and light of this world. Father, use us mightily and that we may be participants of your kingdom and seeking your kingdom first and your righteousness and how you provide all our needs. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. So today, I'm speaking from Psalm 139. So we're almost done with the series in Psalm. And um, I will speak one more next week. And, and, and I'll be done with Psalms. Yeah, I know, I know I haven't covered all 150 of them, you know, but there's just a lot in there. And so I, I think as you re continue to read Psalms and other uh, scriptures in the Old Testament and New Testament, I'm sure it will encourage you greatly. Right? And the Psalm 139 is special because it is written by King David. Right? And when you look at King David, and the Bible talks about King David in a very special way, saying that David was a man after God's own heart. Right? It says that in the Old Testament and as well as the New Testament. Right? So when you look at how somebody have lived a cert certain way and, in a way, summarize that person's life as a person who pursued after God's own heart, that's amazing, right? So we get to kind of see his expression of who God is, right? His understanding of who God is and, and also what he's responding to that God, right? We get to see part of that. And I think it's such a privilege for us to see that. But also, this is just a heart of surrender and repentance, repentance. Right? You know, because our life is not just all about like, oh, I want to do whatever I want to do. But it's, you know, it's a life of knowing that there is a right and there is a wrong. Right? And as we live our life, we want to be corrected. Right? I mean, that's why we drive without your eyes open. Right? Because you want to go straight. You want to go to the place that you need to go. And if you close your eyes, then you're going to be veered off of the straight, you know, street. And you're going to be kind of, you know, causing some accidents. Right? And so as you go to your life or live your life and drive your life or walk in the path of God has laid before you, we want to pay attention. Right? And so that we know where God is leading us and for us to be corrected. And in order for us to be corrected, we have to listen. And you saw how uh, people say, the children say, like, what makes mom happy? You know, when they obey, right? It's, it's, it's true, right? Because then just think about how God's interested in us, right, to guide us, to lead us to the best life that we can live, right? So it is best interest for us, right, to listen and to surrender and to repent, right, and to follow the way of God. And, and this is a very personal, it's not a corporate thing, but expression of how David's relationship with God is. And sometimes, you know, we can be, you know, too emphasis, right, on the corporate part, but, you know, corporate has to be there as well as the individual connection with God, and that's important. And, and as you probably heard that God does not have grandchildren. God only has children. God never invites a people to be his grandkids, right? But God wants to have his children because everyone must have a personal relationship with God. It is a one-to-one -one relationship, one-on-one -on -one relationship with God. Just because your mom or your dad has a close relationship with God, and if you don't have a relationship with God, you know, that doesn't count for anything, right? And so each individual must have that kind of relationship with God, connecting, you know, with that person. I remember reading a book long, long time ago when, before our first, um, Noah was born, and, and it, it, you know, it, 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 it talks about, right, how to raise a kid, right? And, and what you want is to have a one-on-one -on -one adult -to adult conversation with your children about God, Right? And so they have personal relationship with God, as I have personal relationship with God, and talking about our common heavenly Father with one another as an adult to adult, man, that is 
in a way, a success, right? Uh, successful, you know, you know, child rearing. That's what I was talking about. You know, so this psalm has four units, right? Six verses per unit. So six times four is 24 verses total. First three units reveals something about God's character, right? And this last unit is more of a petition, right, based on this revelation who, of who God is. So let, let's read 24 verses. So let me read one first verse, then you can read second verse, and we can rotate, all right? You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. You hem me uh, in behind and before, and you lay your hand upon me. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, if I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me. For you created my inmost being. You knit me be uh, together in my mother's womb. I praise you because my spiritual days and wonders were made. Your My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. How precious to me are your thoughts, God. How vast is the sum of them. If only you, God, would slay the wicked away from me, you who are bloodthirsty. Do I not hate those who hate you, Lord? and abhor those who are in rebellion against you? Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Yeah, amen, amen. Yeah, so for first unit, right, has six verses, and it's talking about how God is omniscient. Right? Omniscient. God's omniscience, right? Omni means all or every, right? And shen means knowledge, right? So God knows everything, right? What, right? God knows everything there is to know. And the fact that God examines and knows David comprehensively, David is puzzled, right? He's like amazed, like, wow, how can this amazing God, God of heavens, God of the universe, Right? Take notice of me and know my, my life and everything about me. Right? And so, you know, even though David was a king of a nation, right? and, and, and just putting David in his mind like uh, as a, as a um, king of a nation, does he know all the people in his kingdom? Probably not. Right? And even, even for me, like maybe we have like 150 total our Korean congregation and all the people who kind of come by our church. I don't know them. Sometimes I, I ask the same person their name every week, you know, maybe more than five times. Like, what was your name again? What was your name again? I was, and it's kind of very confusing sometimes. And like, because our brain is not all there. You know, we're not that smart. Right? But God knows, David. God knows everything you know, there is to know in this universe. Right? And so God examines and knows David comprehensively, right? And, and so, you know, he uses uh, this thing called merism, right? Merism is a figure of speech in which all, like a combination of two 
contrasting parts or, or even opposite parts to mean everything. So when I sit or when I rise, right, I'm going out or lying down or behind or before, right? It's kind of, you know, encapsulating the, the, this end or the opposite end to express every part of that person's life. Or in between, before I sit or after I rise, right? And it's mentioning of everything that happens to David, right? God takes notice. God knows everything, right? When I sit, when I rise, and everything in between. Going out or lying down and everything in between, right? Behind or before everything. So every facet of life, every facet of David's life, right? David's living has been noticed by God. God knows them, right? And the things that he does, things that David does, even things that David thinks about, right? His thoughts, and even the things that David's going to say before David says, right? And so God's saying that I know all about you, you know, and, and I want to a little bit explain to you a little bit later because, you know, God is outside of time, and that's why God can know the future, right? And so here, the emphasis is on God, right? And, and a lot of times, you know, in, in Hebrew or even Greek, right, things can be emphatically written, right? And so here, there's, there's, there's four, six verses, right? God is being emphasized, right? Sometimes, you know, the word God can be, in, you know, just inferred, right, by the way how it's written. But here, you know, the mention of God is emphatically written, right, in telling us who God is. This God is the God of universe, right? God of heaven, right? The God is the subject and the, this cosmic lordship that God has. And this, you know, our Father in heaven notices us and, and knows who David is and knows what David does and knows what David thinks, right? And has a plan for David. This, this relational knowledge is very different than just the informational knowledge, right? Just like for us too. We can know about God, but knowing God is very, very much different than knowing God, right? Knowing uh, somebody as an information versus knowing a person as a relationship is very different. I can know a lot of, about you know, like Stephen Curry or, you know, LeBron James, depending on the which side of the state you live in, right? Right? And right, just it's very different than if I have a personal relationship with that individual, right? So what God is saying that I don't just know you about the information, but I know you, I come to you, I, I'm near you, I hear you, right? I speak to you, right? That kind of personal relationship knowledge that God has with David. And this relationship, right, is not a critical one. Sometimes we, right, we can kind of kind of nitpick of a person and I just want to know about that person so that I can criticize him or I can just find faults in him and just accuse him in a kind of very negative way of knowing that person, right? But God is not like that, right? This is a good kind of relationship. God wants to the best for us. God wants to lead us, right, to everlasting and everlasting way of life, right? So it's not a critical one or hostile one or scrutinizing one, and his attitude is good to us, right? And, and his ability to know David fully, right, it, 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 um, it amazes uh, David a lot, right? And so this verse 6 this, you know, he talks about your knowledge is beyond my comprehension. It is so far beyond me. I am unable to fathom it, right? This is NET version. And looking at all the commentaries that I read, he said this is probably the best translation we can have, right? Just knowing that who God is, God is God of universe, right? God is the one who created everything. And he is the cosmic Lord and he, cosmic king, but he takes notice of us, of people, right? And, and, and wants to have that relationship with us. And, and your knowledge is beyond my comprehension. I cannot understand how you take notice of me. Who are we that you notice us, right? And so that's what um, um, David is admiring God Admiration for God's knowledge and David, and David is secure in that relationship, right? In knowing that God knows David, 
Right? Just imagine, like, you know God knows you, right? That is a comforting thing, right? And knowing that God knows us. And, and, I mean, knowing that God is there is one thing, but knowing that God is there and He notices me, that He is for me, that He loves me, right? Isn't that a big difference between just knowing that God is there, but He's there to love upon me? That he's guiding me, right? He knows what I'm going through, right? I mean, you probably heard many, many testimonies that people are living a very difficult time, but somehow they understand and they may hear this voice of God. And maybe not audibly, but maybe somebody else praying for that, my loving daughter, right? Just that phrase just melts their hearts and understand, wow, my God calls me my loving daughter, my loving son, Right? Just hearing that kind of voice of God, it comforts us, right? It, it secures us, right? It connects us to the living God, and it helps us grow, right? So knowing that God knows us, knows you, it is a big thing, right? And that is an important thing as well, right? And there's words in Matthew 7, a lot of times that, you know, we can just do life without having this understanding of who God is and this assurance of God knowing us and the real fact of God knowing us is a big deal, right? Because in Matthew 7, towards the end of it, and it is the end of the um, Sermon on the Mount, and, it, and, and Jesus says this, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, well, the, the end times, Lord, Lord, do we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Right. So these people, they, they knew God. They, they knew God. Right? But what they lacked is that verse 23 says, Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you away from me. You evil doers. Right? This assurance of God knowing us is very, very important. That's why it's a relationship, right? And so as you do relationship with others, then you know, wow, that person knows me, right? And sometimes that the things that I didn't even know, that person knows me, right? And the bus, that's kind of nature of relationship, right? Because we're so inside and we don't look at ourselves and, you know, I mean, like, maybe we look at the mirror, maybe like total of three minutes each day. But other people constantly look at you and so they know more of me sometimes, of me knowing about ourselves. So that just, just the fact that God knows me and in your relationship with God, right, God assures us that God knows us individually, that is a big thing, right? So God is an omniscient God. All right. So verse 7 through 12 is the, the unit number 2 is that uh, it talks about how God is omnipresent. Right? Present means being there, right? Omni means all. So he's he's present at all places. Right? God is everywhere, right? And so this unit starts with a two rhetorical question which means that the answer to these questions are obvious and very clear, right? It says, "Where can I go from your spirit?" Where can I flee from your presence? And the answer is nowhere, right? Right? Because if it gets God, you are everywhere, right? God is you're everywhere, you are at all times, right? And you're everywhere at the same time, right? And so we cannot go anywhere and flee away from God, and you cannot go anywhere away from the presence of God. Right? And so the answer is nowhere. I cannot go anywhere and I cannot flee from God either because God is everywhere, right? And, and even the examples, right, the heaven and the depths, right? In, in Hebrew, this is Sheol where, you know, most times that is translated to hell even, right? And so it's like, again, it's a merism, right? You know, there's three parts, right? Heaven, earth, and under the earth, kind of that kind of understanding. There's this vertical places where we can be, Right? And so in heaven or under the earth, right? even vertically, there's no place where we can you know, flee uh, God from. And even like the horizontally, right? you know, this east and the west, right? this Bible kind of talks about, you know, uh, where is that? 
Yeah, arise on the wings of the dawn, right? Dawn is the, the east and the settle on the far side of the east, which is the, the opposite side, the uh, right, the west, right? From the horizontal way that I cannot flee the presence of God. And even darkness, right, cannot, right? We cannot run away from God just because it's dark, right? You know, when, when things are dark, dark, you cannot see anything. But the very presence of God brings the light. Right? In Revelation 21, you know, when new earth and new heaven right, and new Jerusalem comes, we, there's no need for sun or moon. Right? You know why? Because the city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it. For the glory of God right, gives it light. And the Lamb is His lamp. Lamb means Jesus, right? Now God and the sun, right, both providing that kind of light. We don't need sun to see. We don't need that kind of light. Very presence of God will provide that light for us. Right? And so this amazing presence of God is a very good thing for us. God's presence will overcome, you know, the very darkness that we may be able to experience. Right? One thing to be right omnipresent and right and omniscient, right? But then what God brings is the guidance. Verse 10. Right? God's hand is there to guide us, to love upon us, right? to show us that He cares. And, and isn't it true that we need guidance in our lives? And raise your hand if you don't need any guidance. Man, we need all kinds of guidance. Right? We do. Even as a, just all your life on this earth, we need guidance. We need wisdom. We need discernment. And we need help. We need to know. Right? And so that is a humility that we need to have and we need to ask God, we need to ask one another right, to be helped right, to one another and finding that unity and finding that right, common understanding and so that we can help one another as we walk this life that God has ordained for us to live. Let me give you an illustration. I, I received a prank call a long, long time ago. Right? And and it's like, and so usually when, you know, this, like, you, when you like, look at the phone number, you don't recognize, and you don't answer it, but sometimes, you know, I answer it so just because, you know, who knows, right? And so, it, there was a prank call, and this person says, like, you want to go on a trip together? Like, I was like, what? You know, I, and I told them, hey, hey, you need some guidance, right? And, and that person says, where are we going? <laughs> you know, uh, we're talking about life. You know, you need some guidance, you know, right? It, it, it's a very strange conversation I had, right? And w so we need this help. We need discernment. You know, we need light, right? And the Bible, Bible says that your word is a lamp on for my feet, right? A light onto my path, right? We need God, right? Word of God, and we need God himself, right? To be in presence, to provide for us stability, Right? Just imagine these, uh, God's hand is our guidance, right? So when you hold on to something, right, it provides stability. It provides comfort because you know somebody else is there, right? We're just holding on to somebody, something, right? It provides that comfort and it guidance and it, it provides that connection because like, I'm not alone, right? Somebody else understands me. Uh, somebody else is next to me, right? So when we do this life, God has this purpose of life for us. And how much we need guidance. And God provides that stability. God provides the strength, right? And even how God is the leader and knowing where we are and where God wants us to go and how we're going to get there. And sometimes we just want to get there by ourselves. But no, God saying, God saying that you need me for you to receive grace, receive help for you to be where I want you to be. Right? And so God provides a direction and God provides a support for us to be there. Right? And so it's almost like Peter in John chapter 6 and, you know, Jesus teaching, you know, a lot of times it was pretty plain and simple, but some teaching was very hard because it was about drinking Jesus' blood and drinking Jesus' body and eating Jesus' body. It is hard, right? It's like, I don't want to be a cannibal. I don't want to eat anybody's right, body and their, you know, right? But he meant spiritually in that sense, like understanding that Jesus is going to die, his flesh, right? He's going to be ripped out and he's, he's going to shed his precious blood. Right, and you know, that kind of thing they could have just simply asked, but because of his teaching was hard, many people left Jesus. And Jesus tells them, Hey, does this offend you? Right? Do you want to leave also? 
right? And the Peter, sometimes we just amazed by Peter that the, the information that God has provided for him, and Jesus, uh, Peter says, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. You have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God, right? This is an amazing thing that where can we go? You know, we don't want to go anywhere because you have the word of life. Right? You are the Holy One of God. You are the one who provides that support and strength and grace, right? And guidance that I need, right? And the, and the next part is that it's explanation of God's omniscience and God's omnipresence, right? And so it's like a explaining, right? You know, because the verse 13, it begins with four, right? So it's giving you understanding of how God is omnipresent and God's omniscient, right? Four, Right, it's kind of explaining how God was uh, there, how God knows everything, and and the explanation is about how God was there, uh, right, in creating David. And if God is saying God created David, if David is confessing or or expressing that God is the one who created David, who created us? Did God just create David? That's it? No, God created us as well. God needed us. God was there from the beginning, right? And again, emphatically, it was you, right? He's saying, you know, God was there from the beginning. God is the one who made everything, right? And so even look at all these words, created my inmost being, right? And some, some other translation talks about the intestines, right? And how like inside stuff is very... You know, kind of gross, you know, but it's very uh, uh, complicated and very wonderful. You know, where our small intestines are like six meters long and 20 feet long. And like, it's amazing how our stuff inside works. And when those things do not work, we get sick. My wife is kind of sick a little bit, <laughs> right? And so that's how it is. And when things don't get work right and, and you get sick, right? And knit me together in my mother's womb fearfully and Wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. My frame was not hidden from you. And some people may think that's a, kind of the frame, the, the, the skeleton, right? And I was made in a secret place, right? You know, and just this sense of um, mystery is there, right? But then it just doesn't end as a mystery. But we know that, yes, the whole process could be mystery. But then we know who did it. We know the author of that mystery. Right? We, there is an answer right, of that mystery of God you know, making us. There is the one who made us. There is the one who is the creator, the, the one who has a purpose for us. Right? Right? And so this God's like, you know, uh, understanding of God's plan that is being written, right, that provides a certain permanency of what God has done and what God is willing to do in our lives. This plan of God is not just obscure. This plan of God is not just abstract, right? This plan of God is very certain things and he is making a, a, a statement of promise, right? And he's saying that I know the plans that are high for you, not to harm you, but give you future and hope, right? And also we understand this, how uh, our life is very special, because God is the one who made us, right? It's sanctity of life, right? I think, you know, sometimes we, we, we may think, oh, abortion is not a big deal. Well, abortion is wrong, right? Of course, there's other factors, right? It's, a, it's a, to save the mother's life or children's life. Yeah, there's other factors of it. But in generally, abortion, to get rid of a little un, right, unformed, uh, you know, uh, baby inside, and that's not right, right? Right? So we need to understand this. There's sanctity of life, and we have to understand this. We, you know, God has a, a plan for our lives, and he says, all the days ordained for me were written in your book. Right? right? God knows the plan that God has for us, that permanency of it. God knowing and God remembering and God working out that plan of God. You know, and, and God's plan is a very good plan. Right? It's not plans to harm us. But it's, the, it's a plan to give us a future and hope. And it's a good plan of God. And, and, and how, how David says it's a precious plan. Right? It means very valuable and it's very weighty. Right? And, and what is the plan of God? To be saved and become children of God. 
God wants that every connection to individuals, right? Right? To become our heavenly father. That's what God desires. God created every one of us, and God wants to be that father, right? To us. And God wants to be that father to all humanity. And in Christ Jesus, right, we have that identity in Christ. It's not about how smart we are, how much money we make, right? How good looking we are. It's not about our achievements, but it's about, right, this having this new identity in Jesus Christ and living out that plan of God in our lives, right? And, and 2 Corinthians 5 17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, that he is a new creation, right? The old has gone and the new has come. Right? All this is from God. And yet sometimes ask, oh, so what? what? What is important about being a new creation? Right? When you keep reading on, it talks about how God has reconciled us to himself in Jesus Christ. And now God has that given us that ministry of reconciliation right? to be in the world, reconciling right, people to God in Jesus Christ. Right? Is that so what factor? Right? It's not just, oh, I'm a new creation and I can just do whatever I want. No, it's not like that. Specifically, God is saying, Jesus is saying to us that as a new creation, we have a ministry of reconciliation. Ephesians 2, 10 is the same thing. For we are God's handiwork. You know, some version says God's masterpiece created in Christ Jesus. Right? It's not, it doesn't end there. It ends with to do good works. Right? Which God prepared in advance for us to do. Right? Because we, right, not that we have to do it, but we get to do it. Right? We get to do the work of God that God has recruited us. Right? That we get to represent Christ, represent God in this world, you know, bringing people in connection with God. Right? So, you know, David explains this God's knowing everything and God being everywhere and explains that by how God was there from the beginning and knowing that God was in David's life from the beginning, it comforts him for that he knows the plan that God has for David, right? And the last unit, it is mostly the application, right? This is how he, right, as a, right, you know, kind of petition to God based on who God is, how God is omniscient, how God knows everything, right? God is everywhere, right? And God has proven to him and to us that he was there from the beginning and the sense of mystery and, you know, how our body and soul and our spirit and how everything works. It is very, very mystery. But then the answer to that is because we are right, connecting with God. We are connecting with one another. We are connecting to this world that we're living in Right? And so God is guiding us. And how do we live, you know, based on that understanding? That knowing that God was there from beginning with us. That God created us. God has a plan for us. Right? God was there from the beginning. Right? That God is there to know everything. And, and if you know there's a person like that, what do you want to do? We want to listen to that person. Right? We want to follow that person. Right? We want to obey that person. And we want to make sure that we stay in the path that that person provides for us. Because he knows everything. He knows everything there is to know. Right? Wouldn't you listen to that person? If that person is there next to you, don't you wish that had a, you had that kind of person when you're taking your test? Like, hey, what's this the number? You know, right? right? You're taking any kind of test or right? any, any question that you may have, you want to ask that person who knows everything there is to know. Right? And so this last unit expresses David's desire to the plan of God, his submission, his repentance. Right? David wants to align himself to God, which is proper response to a person, to a God that who has been with him, who knows everything there is to know, who is for him, who created him. Right? So, right? And so... You know, and, 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 you know, this, this section talks about the wickedness, the, you know, the wicked people, the bloodthirsty people, the enemy of God who opposes God, right? Who, who hates God, and that word hate, it kind of means to reject God, who is rejecting God, who despises God, you know, and what do we do with them? And I think what the Bible is telling us and has application, make sure we're not influenced by them. 
There are a lot of evil. There are a lot of wickedness out there, right? Right? There are. Right? And make sure that we don't get influenced by that people, by that kind of thought and that kind of ways of life. Right? This is enemy of God. Right? Sure, we can be there to influence them, influence the enemies of God, but make sure that you don't get influenced by them. Right? So we have to be careful. Right? And things can be a little bit wrong or things can be a lot wrong. Still it's wrong. Right? Right? And even, like, okay, how, how, can, how can you test that out? Like poison. A little bit of poison versus a, you know, a lot of poison. You don't want any poison. Like even dirty things, right? A little bit of poo-poo, right? Or big poo-poo. Like, uh, would you eat that? I won't even go near it. Right? 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 Because it's, you don't want anything dirty, anything unclean, anything, you know, like bad, like poison stuff. Like we, don't, we want to stay away from that. Right? Um, again, I'm not saying, right, we can be there to influence them, but don't be influenced by them. Because devil's scheme is in very, very much various forms of devil can attack us, right, for us to be influenced, right? So there's a lot of influencing factor, even our social media or just TV and movies in general, right? We have to really guard our hearts right? because it is the wellspring of life. Right? And the second application is that we need to ask God to show us where we might have departed from God's ways. Right? It's kind of very beautiful and humble way of asking that. Right? It's, it's humility. We need to be humble. Right? We need to not be prideful and not making excuses in the ways that we live our life, you know, or, or even your theological stand, but having an open mind of, of everything right? as we read the Word of God and as we do life, how God needs to continue to write His law, His understanding, His ways into our hearts. Right? And there definitely there are written rules, right? written way of what's very clearly what's right and what's wrong, right? You know, of, of things that we need to, like how we need to live, love, right? Forgive, you know, the covenantal relationships, the gospel of Jesus Christ, and even the great ones too, right? Right, dating, time management, drinking, and all these kind of things, I, you know, a little bit gray areas and we have to understand in, in light of the community that God has given us, right? And there are personal ones too, like God may say to me, you know, of some of the, my idols that I may have and for me to really give up. But that doesn't mean that God is telling you guys to give it up either, right? We may, in a way, misappropriate that. You know, but then there, there's some other factor because how we live in this community because, right, how God is not just thinking about by ourselves, but if the things that I do, Right? If that is stumbling one on other people, and that is definitely wrong, Bible talks about. Right? Right? And so, 1 Peter 2.16 says, Live as free people, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Right? Live as God's slaves. Right? Use our freedom to do the things that God is asking us to do. Right? And then also this verse talks about you know, anxious, right? Know my anxious thoughts. But sometimes it is true that maybe David was under a threat of his enemies and how that causes worry. Right? And so we may be worried the, of the, you know, the worldly offenses or worldly thoughts and it's kind of, you know, you know kind of, bothering us and makes us more worried. And you know, Philippians 4, 6, 7 says in your thanksgiving, right, make sure that all your supplication is known to God, right, and do not be anxious about anything, right? So, so sometimes things are not very clear. There are different people and we have different convictions. So the humility is important, right, in order for us to make the body of Christ. Bible says we submit to one another, as you are filled with the Holy Spirit, we submit to one another. Right? You don't have to, you just always submit to me. No, we submit to one another. And we need to, you know, be living in that kind of understanding and applying those principles that God has given us. And not just principles, but in facts of how are we submitting to one another. Yeah. And sometimes, you know, you don't get what you want and I just leave because there's tons of other churches out here, you know. Sometimes we just take those things very, very lightly 
right? No, we have to take it very seriously in the ways that we live out in our relationship with God, right? Even in, in, even in, in how we can have unity, right? In this community, how do we do that, right? And one of the pastors talked about when I went to Ontario, he says two times two is four, and two plus two is four, right? And the, both are fours. And he says, okay, what, are, what is the difference between the first four and the second four? Oh, man, you know, I, I'm an engineer, right? And, you know, and then I'm like, oh, like, it was the same, right? But then, it, it, yeah, sure, in purely mathematical sense, it is same. But then when you put a unit there, like two inches plus two inches is four inches. But two inches multiplied by two inches is four square inch. The unit's different. And, and he was talking about it, the unity in that sense, like how can one wife and one husband combine together and become one flesh? Right? And he was talking about the unit changes. When you, when, when you remain as an old self, old unit, then you could never have a unity. One plus one is always two. Right? But when you multiply, when you come together, when your dimension changes, right? One man and one husband and one wife can be a one couple. Right? You know, one God, the Father, God, the Son, God, the Holy Spirit, together become one Godhead. Right? Unit changes. Right? And in that God plus the people of God becomes one body of Christ. And when you just remain as a one individual, you could never have unity. Right? And this is unity is very important for us to humble ourselves. Right? As we, all of them, for us to repent from our sinful ways. Right? And to walk in this life that God has ordained for us to live. Right? Putting the community above our individual needs and our wants. And David wanted to remain clean and be connected before God. Right? David wanted God to test him. Right? Know my anxious thoughts. Right? How, do you, how do you test? It's like the refiner testing a metal, how pure it is. And the way the, the, the refiner knows that how pure a metal is, is after cleansing, after cleansing, after cleansing, is to see the reflection of the refiner on that liquid metal. And so for us, are we reflecting the face of Jesus in the ways that we are loving, in the ways that we are generous, in the ways that we are forgiving, in the ways that we are being the salt and light of this world, right? To live the everlasting way that God has ordained for us to live, right? And enjoying that way of everlasting and knowing that God is there. Knowing that God knows everything. Knowing that God was there from the beginning. Knowing that God has a plan for us. Knowing that God even has a, given us a way for us to repent based on what Jesus has done. That he has died for us on the cross. That our sins are forgiven. There is a way for us to come back to God. Because that Jesus has paid the price of our disobedience. That Jesus has paid on the cross for us. Right? So that we can come. We can come to him. We can repent. Right? We can enjoy this life everlasting and ever and ever again. Right? I think a lot of times that we really lack that last part, that we don't enjoy this, that we just like, we, we have to do this. Right? We don't really enjoy the presence of God, knowing that Almighty God, the Lord of the Lord and King of Kings, who notices us, who knows us, who knows, their, who knows us from the beginning, right? That's just a wow factor for who am I that God knows me, right? Are you thankful that God knows you, that not notices you, right? He knows what you're going through, right? That he has made a way for you to come to him through his son, Jesus Christ, right? And I think definitely we've got to understand that and, you know, really enjoy the way that God has given us the way everlasting for us, right? And so as David's desire to, right, David's desire to God's plan has been like shown and written, you know, I think we need to have that heart as well, yeah? So as the worship tip come up, I want to give you just a few, like, you know, like a minute for you to really ask, right? Right? And, and as we live in this life, like how am I being influenced by the wickedness of our I might be even aware of that. Yeah. You know, devils out there and prowling against us to devour us. 
right? And he hates God, and he, he doesn't like us being connected with God, and he wants to do anything he can do for us to thwart the plan of God, for us to be away from God, and how we need to ask God to show us where we might have departed from God's ways. Right? How am I sinning, right? Even just a little bit of it, right? and asking God to reveal that to us so that we can repent right? based on the finished work of Jesus Christ, that we can come to him and then really enjoy that loving relationship with God. Right? And those of you who never have expressed your relationship with God, maybe this is your time for you to know, for you to express like, oh man, how much God loves me, right? And how much God is for you, how much God knows you, how, God much, how much God knew you from the beginning, Right? And, and how much God wants to have the relationship with you and to be included in the family of God. So let's take a minute, and based on these four points, I ask God to reveal to us and we can repent of our sinful ways and go back to Him and enjoy the way everlasting with God.